So now we're going to talk about overclocking with uh, JJ from ASUS on the new Z77 series of motherboards. Now, one of the things that I know that I think maybe some people might be surprised about is the Ivy Bridge processors overclock differently than Sandy Bridge. There are kind of some more limitations involved in the power and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so people maybe need to set their expectations a little bit differently uh, than they had in the previous generation. I would agree with that. Um, I definitely think that first and foremost, I want to clarify that the it's n it's not any limited in any way in terms of the performance, right? Because uh, CPC is there. It's a, it's faster clock per clock. Right. So even if you're bringing down that frequency relative to at least air overclocking, um, you're still getting outstanding performance. And we're still talking about very high performance m numbers. Uh, but the reality is that with the changes to the lithography uh, that you have in play and uh, how that works relative to TDP and how it's dissipated, mm -hmm. um, there are some some more considerations to take into play that definitely uh, weren't present in, in previous generations. I think that okay. last couple of generations, right, I think you would agree that in most situations your baseline maximum voltage has been probably fairly similar, right? Yes. You know, let's say between like 1.4 to like about 1.45, it's been fairly comfortable I think for most people and for the guys that were even maybe even a little bit more comfortable, 1.5 wasn't entirely out of reason mm -hmm. uh, for some individuals. I, I don't generally recommend that level of voltage, um, but there were definitely people that were running it, you know, at that 49, 50, 51, 52 multipliers, hmm. right? Um, for this generation, I think that realistically under air cooling, even under a good quality air cooling, you know, with uh, 220, 140 millimeter fans, closed loop fans, big tower heat sinks, doesn't really matter. Um, 4.8 is probably going to be your effective real world high clock value okay. that you're going to shoot at. Um, that being what voltages are those running at? Um, the voltages are also, we're going to probably be taking a look at much more conservative voltages of about a maximum 1.325 to 1.35. So these are quite a bit under, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. our previously set expectations, right? It's kind of expected though when we move from the 32 to the 22 nanometer right. uh, technology that you do run at lower voltages, but I think maybe some people would expect to be able to push those voltages okay. up still right. to what we were at before, right. be and that doesn't result in anything. Exactly, uh, yeah, exactly. Is especially, I think, compared to previous platforms, you think, okay, lower voltages, lower temperature means more headroom, mm -hmm. right, for me. And uh, that is actually is true. The, um, there's, there's certain things on the extreme end that we've seen in our testing um, where there's things like the cold bug or frequency limitations that are no longer in play. Right. Uh, we, we've seen actually numbers internally, like on our uh, very high-end boards, like the ROG series, going over 7 gigahertz. Um, hmm. which we haven't been able to actually do under Sandy Bridge E or Sandy Bridge architectures. Okay. Okay. Um, so on the extreme end, it's actually even opened up more, but uh, for at least the relative, you know, the majority of us that are looking to just kind of overclock our systems, get some more performance out of it, we're going to be dealing with a little bit more limited. You didn't bring LN2 with you. Uh, no, no. Okay. Didn't, so didn't we're going to look more at the, at the, at the much more mainstream style of overclocking. Right. Okay. Uh, but I think you also made a good point in saying that uh, in terms of conservative voltage tables, it's outstanding. When you talk about your effective overclocking ranges of like 4.2 to 4.4, mm -hmm. we're talking, you know, 1.2 volts, um, you know, sometimes even a little bit less than that. That's, that's outstanding. Um, and even 4.8 at 1.35 is pretty cool. Um, I think it's just a question that you need to understand the, uh, the temperature ranges that are going to be in accordance with that. Because if you put that under full load with a stress application, right, where you're running 100% load, right. you could be looking at, you know, 85 to 90 C on all your cores. And that's using realistic stress testing applications like, let's say, wow. like ADA. Okay. Um, you know, which uh, is validated by us as well as Intel and other parts. For reference, what would you expect under Sandy Bridge? Um, Sandy Bridge, you could get away, uh, you know, if you had good cooling, much maybe closer to, let's say, 70 you know, 75C. It's pretty C. significant so it's temperature a, difference. Yeah, so the yeah. delta is, is quite a bit different. And those temperatures are also with a discrete GPU, so it's not like we have the iGPU even active. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't expect probably a huge amount of people to be aggressively overclocking and, and, and then, then using and, IGPU I, I, at the same right, time. and then rising the iGPU. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an important consideration to make, and I would also like to note at this point, you know, we want to be conscientious that with these voltage considerations and with these temperature considerations, um, I wouldn't advocate um, non-validated stress applications. Um, so these are going to be things like, you know, Prime 95, OCCT, Lynx. I know that there's a huge amount of enthusiasts People out there. People are very um, used to using those. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, we have to be cognizant of the fact that architectures change and sometimes certain software hmm. hasn't been validated for that. Um, not a lot of people take the time to do it, but like let's say open up Prime 95 and you open up on new CPU architectures, there's a very big tag at the top that says CPU architecture unknown. You're running essentially special uh, software that's running on this that's not fully understood by even the software package. Nice. And uh, that, that okay. could, you don't want to potentially 
might damage your CPU. You know, we're not worried about it from a board stage. You know, the hardware will hold up, um, but you know, it, it wouldn't be that great to have your CPU burn out, right? Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so with that, let's I guess take a look at some of the ways that I guess we're approaching overclocking. Okay. Um, so we've got a couple of definitely very easy ways. Um, so right off the bat, you know, on the board level, um, you know, we've got some switches that are physically here, which maybe we can show one of the boards. Yeah, we've got another board. We've got maybe a handful of those here. Yeah. On the WS? Yeah, WS should be, there we uh, go. Should be okay. So on the WS board, um, we've got two different board, uh, two different switches. So if we take a look uh, right here, we've got actually the EPU switch, which is going to be the opposite for uh, people actually interested in overclocking. This won't actually make any changes uh, relative to uh, frequency. It is only going to execute an actually undervolt algorithm. So this is great for people that want to run stock, but they just want to apply less voltage. Uh, less voltage to the to the CPU um, so that you can go ahead and have lower operating temperatures. Okay. okay? Um, so not, not overclocking related, okay? Uh, then up here on the other end, we have the TPU switch. And the TPU switch is going to be just a very easy way to effectively execute a quick overclock. Um, so for somebody that doesn't really know anything, they just want to go ahead and increase it. If you had like a 3770K, mm -hmm. you just flip that switch and you're approximately taking it up to about 4.3 gigahertz by just flipping that over. Now, do you have to flip that before you boot type uh, th of thing? Yeah, that's correct. So when you're first setting up your system, just flip that switch over and you're okay. good to go. And you could execute the same function within the UEFI um, or within the software interface. So depending on wherever you are in the building process, you can always have access to that same easy preset. Gotcha. So that's a very easy uh, mechanism to go ahead and play with. Okay. Okay. Um, now, outside of that, uh, of course, we've got a fully set up system here with some pretty nice parts. So I think some of the users might want to see what's it look like on the UFI level in terms of some of the adjustments that we might make, as well as what it looks like from, I think, an operating, sp uh, uh, operating system perspective mm -hmm. and what we might be able to do with uh, some of our software like auto-tuning. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I'd say from this point, uh, we can go ahead and detail a little bit what we have running here so you have an idea of, I guess, what we're capable of. And then from there, we can go into the UEFI. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so we've got uh, 3770 uh, on this uh, setup right here. Um, excuse me. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, 3770K. Uh, we okay. have an H60 uh, closed loop water cooling system with two 120 millimeter fans. Okay, and then we've got four DIMMs uh, here. So this is some G-Skill Trident X. This is 2800 kits. Um, so we've got more than enough headway in terms of that uh, right. for the memory. So no worries there. So um, we're going to go ahead and I guess jump over to the UEFI and take a look down there. Sounds good. Okay. So we should be able to see this uh, through a streaming machine. If we swap over to it, do we see? Yeah. One of the benefits of this capture equipment is we can get into the UEFI. Very cool. So uh, see that. So uh, in your experience, what do you see the split between users that want to overclock in the UEFI versus they want to overclock in Windows? Um, it's actually increased over time. It's a, it's a very good question. I will say still that uh, probably close to over 75% of our users are executing an overclock um, within the UEFI environment. Um, but that's still actually pretty good to say that 25% of our users have now started to consider the software environment a place that they can start to make actually adjustments um, in terms of overclocking, whether it's real-time just adjustments or whether it's something like it's running our auto overclocking software. Okay. And this has grown you know, from even from the P55 area where uh, era where we were seeing essentially zero to two percent of users making adjustments on software mm -hmm. to now you know being uh, that percentage I think is actually a pretty good uptick okay. uh, to, to show that. So, uh, so here we've gone ahead and we've entered actually into the UEFI and so if we take a look here of course right we have a uh, mouse support and where we talked about, remember that TPU switch functionality mm -hmm. and the EPU switch functionality, that's actually what these two icons represent. So uh, this icon right here serves the same exact function as the EPU switch, and this button right here serves the same exact function as the TPU switch. Okay. Um, so that's going to be for the just, you know, easy, very moderate level overclocking guys, but here we're looking to go ahead and extend that a little bit further. So in that regard, we want to go ahead and go actually into the advanced mode. So from here, we're going to go ahead and enter and 
and go into our AI tweaker section. This looks very familiar to the Z68 X79 style UFEI. Correct. correct. Okay. Yeah, we've kept things very consistent in this regard, so not a huge amount of changes here. Um, so the, the main things that we're going to probably try to touch on is that, one, I want to give the tip to some users is think a little bit out of the box. Most users usually always focus at nothing but what's called a locked a multiplier overclocking. This is a very limited mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. to think about overclocking. Um, a much more intelligent way is actually to approach it from the same way that the Intel Turbo architecture actually works, which dynamically the frequency will scale based off of load um, and also off of temperature factors. Um, so it, you can overclock very much in the same way. Um, so in this regard, you could go ahead and let's say, say one core to 50, right? Where even though on all cores we're limited to let's say 48, Mm -hmm. We could go ahead and set one to actually uh, 50, two to you know 49, right, and then all cores to 48. So you could actually extend it past um, the quote unquote 48x marker, but you just do an asynchronous level of overclocking instead of doing a lock level and, of clocking. And do you see uh, like the same stability in your overclocking, the same overclockability of that yeah. part using and that as opposed to the fixed? Correct, and you would also have the advantage that generally because you're only pushing that one single core, you could keep the voltage tables essentially the same because mm, you're not trying to push okay. all the cores. Okay. Um, so you're still working within the same actually voltage tables. Um, and if you want to be really efficient, you could go the same route as well, um, which is essentially go ahead and just maybe uh, dial in more conservative values, but go ahead and make adjustments to the voltage. So that can, of course, be adjusted here in terms of the ratio control enablement. That's very easy to work with. Um, another option that we probably want to talk about a little bit here is going to be relative to uh, the actual voltage that you choose. So here you can see that we have an option that if you select CPU voltage, there's two options like there are in the majority of boards where there being a manual voltage and an offset voltage. Uh -huh. So most users usually default to just manual voltages. Uh, we'd like to recommend, especially for this platform and the sensitivity that it has under load at higher frequencies, be more sensible and consider an offset voltage. Um, with an offset voltage right, it tracks what's called the VRD. So as the multiplier makes an adjustment, the voltage changes. The main benefit of that is, is if I dial in 1.35 volts uh, for my 4.8 gigahertz overclock, right. when my CPU goes to an idle frequency of let's say 1.6, what voltage am I still running at? 1.35. Yeah. That's not very efficient. I'm driving more voltage to the CPU than is required. If I use an offset voltage, then I'm tracking the VRD path, and when that voltage drops down along with the multiplier, then I'm only at the, my voltage will also drop down, and then when the overclock loads up and hits up to the, to the turbo multiplier that we have defined like 48 or whatever it might be, right. then the voltage also goes up. So a much friendlier overclock in terms of reducing power consumption, okay. helping to extend CPU lifespan, and bring you less temperature. Um, so that's, it is a little bit trickier to deal with, and this is where one of the things I think we'll show in the operating system that it's easier to make offset adjustments real time and see what voltage you're actually dealing with um, than it is within the UEFI, right? Because in the UEFI, it's kind of hard to know if I make a change to the offset and I start to raise this, I don't really know what point you know, zero two zero means in addition to my base bid. Right. Where if I do it manually, S it's, since it's a constantly changing. Yeah, yeah. Manually, it's easier for me to understand what that value might be, right? Um, the last one that we'll kind of touch on here is a little bit under the Digi Plus power controls, uh, which if we go ahead and go there, is load line calibration. Same thing, um, like we've talked about, we want to be a little bit more sensitive for this platform. Keep in consideration that when you do load line calibration, um, it's going to be very coarse at sometimes adding more vid than you're going to need it to. So we usually recommend that if you're going to treat with load line, first actually shoot uh, from a regular standpoint where you're not actually adding any you're not compensating for the droop. Droop is not actually bad. There's a perception on the right. community yeah, yeah, yeah. that you should always fight against this supposed droop. Um, but the better way to actually overclock is to actually keep it with the droop in play, but just compensate your voltage upwards um, and keep okay. the droop in play. The main reason why we actually have implemented low line calibration is that at higher level overclocks with more stressful applications, you might not be able to afford any variance in drooping. So therefore, you need to keep more rigidity, more stability in terms of the voltage supply. Gotcha. So really kind of depending on what you're doing, you know, might, might make sensibility as to why you might want to do a load line calibration adjustment. All right. 
Okay, so that I think gives a little bit of perspective behind kind of the UEFI and some of the things you might want to consider. There's definitely, of course, a lot more advanced options in there. Um, you know that we that we can that we have detailed and you can get more information about in, in, in our forms and our in, in different sources. Um, but I think from here, uh, the next step is uh, to maybe go into the operating system and take a look at, and see where the the our auto tuning software can actually give us in terms of the ranges of overclocking. Okay. Okay. So we're just going to go ahead and load full defaults, what I've done there. So it's F5. So we can treat the board as an 100% just baseline. So if we just boot up and we start from there, what happens? Gotcha. Okay. We've gone ahead in here, now booted back into our operating system. And we're just going to go ahead and launch our AI Suite 2 software. So what we're going to go ahead and do here is execute actually what's called our auto tuning process. Um, this actually software works on a pure hardware level as well. So you're seeing the software front end, but it does work with our TPU chip on the motherboard. And what this does is essentially the same thing that you would actually normally do. Um, it makes adjustments to the multiplier, to the core voltage. Can we run the magnifier while it says that too? Sure. To see, because I want to see. We can see, it, it, I like the fact that it's reporting what is going on real time. Uh, on the screen in real time as well. So. so right now we essentially have a full default level overclock, uh, excuse me, full uh, stock value of operation. So what we're going to go ahead and do is not click the fast button. The fast button is the same essentially as the TPU switch or that, uh, yeah, that easy mode option within the UEFI of about mm -hmm. that 4.3 gigahertz. So what we're going to do is click this extreme button, which is actually going to go through a dynamic scaling process. Okay. And the reason why the dynamic scaling process is important is because it's specific to our platform. If we had, let's say, for instance, like a different CPU cooler or something else running, it, it's going to give you a different result. So the fast setting is ASUS knows this process or this board will be able to do this. We'll Correct. set it and go. Mm -hmm. Extreme is... Well, you might have a better cooler. You might have uh, a better, better CPU, memory. Yeah, better, yeah but, uh, you might have been lucky to get a better processor. Let's do the normal steps that you would do in some kind of automated fashion. Correct, in an okay. automated fashion, and that's all being fed real time into the UEFI, and it will even apply a stability test, and we'll show actually how that occurs. Okay. So let's go ahead and click the start button. Uh, from here, what's actually going to do is it's going to feed information to the UEFI and load in a baseline preset that it's going to then begin the scaling process from. Okay. So we'll reboot again here. Yes, and at this point, uh, the actual auto tuning software has fed uh, this preset-based data to the actual UEFI, and then once we actually get into the operating system, you could go ahead and stop it at that point if you wanted to from that baseline preset, but at that point, it now will actually begin the full scaling process. And from there, we'll actually get to see um, the task manager we can open up, and we can show you actually how the process is actually being utilized. Hmm. It's fully putting it under a, a load. Um, it's actually very similar to an IPC-centric load that you have like under a program like Prime95. Right. Um, it's been internally developed by us. Um, so that actually will go through the staging process and it will incrementally scale up both the multiplier and the BCLK, uh, which will also have effect on actually our DRAM as well. So not only the CPU will get overclocked, um, the iGPU will also get overclocked, and then the DRAM will also get overclocked. Now I should point out for people who are watching the video, because we're doing two displays, it turns out that the primary display is actually uh, the one that's facing us, Correct. so uh, we don't see the windows here until we actually get back into windows. But yeah, good, good, good point. It doesn't make sure it wasn't. They didn't think it was stalling out or anything. Yeah. So, um, so we can see right here, it's already alerting to us to the fact that we've successfully completed this baseline overclock of. I like that it says congratulations. Yeah. Well, of course, man. You, know, you <laughs> want to feel good about overclocking your board, right? Um, so we've got 4.2 gigahertz essentially, right? Um, so at this point, we could go ahead and click the stop button. Mm. Okay, uh, but we're going to go ahead and let it continue to scale. Okay, and the main reason actually why we have some people say is why do we have like the little timer? Yeah, is because depending on your operating system environment, we don't know how many programs you're loading. So we've approximated that generally at least about one minute usually okay. gives like uh, services and different things and stuff. Maybe right. loading more or less to kind of load up in the background. Okay, um, so that we can then go ahead and, and restart the system. Like Steam. Like Steam, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of us are running their Steam, so we. Have, so we don't want to abruptly cut off the system. I, no, that makes sense. So um, from here, we're now, of course, 10 second countdown. We're going to get into the operating system. And now it's going to begin the actual real time scaling process. So we're going to see CPU frequency go ahead and go up. So let's go ahead and just uh, quit out there of our steam. Now we can see right here, it's gone ahead and focused in on the multiplier. Just raised it up one. So when we're going to 43, we actually have our CPU fan ramping we open up our task manager and we go to performance, we can see right here all cores are actually being yep, utilized. Full CPU load. Full okay. CPU load. So it's actually fully stressing the system at this point that it's raised 
uh, this value. This is just like what you would normally do if you were overclocking the system manually, right? You make an adjustment, you stress test. So it just went from 42 to 43 because it passed, multiplier. passed that initial stress test. It runs a test again. Exactly. And it's going to now continue to scale through that process. Does the software tend to focus on the multipliers, we go find the top, and then focus on B clock? We find its top? We, yes, uh, we go through a combination of both. We don't just do one. Uh, we do actually do a part multiplier, and then we also do a part B clock value. So at that point, actually, that error that you saw was not an error in the program failing. Um, it was actually a stress point in terms of the overclock, reaching okay. a stability point. Uh, so that's the system is now actually. So that's, been, that was normal. That we, was normal. It wasn't a, wasn't a shock to anybody. Yeah. Um, so it, what we saw then was it hit the multiplier. Right, and it made the change, and at the voltage that unstable. was unstable. Yeah, the voltage that was being supplied, it was unstable, and so now it's going to get, continue the scaling process. Gotcha. Um, but it's going to have kept all that data. The TPU chip is logging all that essentially, mm. and we can even see right here if you do see this boot screen, it's at a reduced boot timer. I so see. normally yeah, you have five, like 30, usually thirty seconds. Thirty seconds, but we already have that modified to be a, a quicker boot. Gotcha. So now it's going to boot back up, go slightly off the previous attained value, mm -hmm. and make an adjustment to, uh, to voltage, and then make some other adjustments, and it will continue moving forward in the scaling process. Okay. So same like before, you can see now that we've reached a new higher value. Okay. We're now at 4.429 gigahertz. Okay. And from here, it will now, same thing, do the countdown timer. If you were comfortable with this point, once again, you still have the same option. You can go ahead and stop it. So effectively, you know, auto-tuning does have these breaks built in within it that it could be as little as, let's say, maybe like a two-minute process. Mm. Or generally in the maximum that we've seen with outstanding CPUs and outstanding coolers, uh, where you've got more granular, excuse me, more uh, cooling performance to be able to scale higher, you could be looking at maybe about up to 10 minutes. Um, and that, of course, will partially be affected by your storage device as well. And it, and it can be completely hands-off. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can uh, exactly. You can just walk away. We, we don't ever have to sit here. Once we okay. actually click that extreme button, you know, go make yourself a cup of coffee, you know, go, <laughs> you know, go let the dog out. Make a sandwich. That yeah, kind of I, I like that idea, making a sandwich. That's always good. I like to make a sandwich while I'm overclocking. Um, so you let it go through that process. You let it treat scale. And once it's completed at the very end, it actually will give you a final screen that tells you this is the maximum value that I've hit relative to the CPU and to the iGPU. Now, I know, uh, so, so now we're, we're, we've moved... It's, it's next portion. Went to the, went to the B clock value. Is B next. clock value is what's next. We, mm. it's kind of maybe made a decision on the multiplier. Exactly. Uh, so it's going to increase B clock. Do the same stability test while it does it. Exactly. Okay. And uh, the temperature and all this stuff is being logged in, in, in for effect. And I do want to make the point that this software is only using an offset voltage mechanism. So some mm. of those advantages that we talked about before, when when the overclocking process occurs, right? Um, and that, that's exactly, it's targeting those values and it will keep all those values in relation to the maximum points of temperature it keeps. Um, but the, the offset voltage that's being used has the advantage that as the CPU scales down under idle, the voltage drops as well. So we're not like using any extreme like overcurrent enablement or high mm -hmm. levels of low lag calibration or manually fixed voltages, which while potentially could give you a higher even overclock value, um, are a little bit more aggressive and, of course, could de degrade your, your CPU over the long term. So we want to keep this where it scales high, but also still safe while being effective. Now, I, I think maybe some users will wonder, uh, this is great to yep. get the software, this, this automated system to it. How much more can you squeeze out of this? Like, how, how close does it get to your actual maximums? Well, Is it something that, well, if you've got a person who's going in and adjusting these you have UEFI BIOS files that you can you can get more out of it if you want, sure. but it's how much time you want to spend to get that last yeah, the, ounce. The, yeah, exactly. How much you're going to push the envelope, right? Um, in that regard, if we talked about and say that 4.8 gigahertz is our realistic maximum even manually tuned, mm -hmm. um, you know, with relatively the margin of CPUs that we've gone through and tested, which at this point is in is in the hundreds. We go through multiple CPUs, multiple steppings to compile this data. Um, you're getting usually somewhere between uh, right towards 4.5 to a little bit over 4.5. And the best auto tune CPUs are almost 4.6 gigahertz. That's not that far away mm -hmm. from your upper end frequency of 4.8. And you know, keep in mind that for only at a maximum 10 minutes worth of time, even if you're manually tuning it, you can still always go after we've laid that groundwork for you and still complete the manual tuning. Okay. Right? So, because uh, even if you were to remove the software, right? So let's say it finishes the entire value, 
and you don't want AI Suite on uninstall your computer anymore, AI uninstall suite. it, it doesn't matter. That value is now stored within your UEFI. Hmm. So we're writing that directly on a low level, on a hardware level, and it's executed upon. So at that point, it's up to you if you want to go ahead and keep incrementing further. Um, but still, it's a time saver because, right, I mean, you know this. You've spent a lot of time overclocking platforms. Yes. Every new platform, it can probably take you at least a couple of hours, I think, to kind of learn the platform, at know least. where your voltage tables are yeah. at, kind of know how to stress test it, see where everything's at. So this is actually pretty reasonable to just click through, see where the scaling results are at. And we can see here, we're actually scaling pretty well. We're um, at 4.6 right now, yeah. so 107B clock. Right. And with Ivy Bridge, are we seeing um, increased flexibility in that B clock? Yes. Compared to Sandy Bridge? Yeah, we've done some special um, design layout on our boards that does give us actually a little bit higher Beacock margin. Um, but in it in itself, yes, you are seeing a, a small increment uh, bump up in terms of the BCLK BC value, where I think on Sandy Bridge, you were closer to, generally your maximum was about 103 to maybe good CPUs being 105. Um, with this generation, we're seeing about uh, additional two to three value bumps. Um, okay. that, that there's a little bit more margin in there. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit more flexible. Now, I notice we're increasing by uh, not full clock value rates either. Is that available to the user in the UEFI as well? 100%. You okay. can go in those. And if you're smart, that's also another way that you go through overclocking because those point values can be the make or break difference. If you decide to just go a full 101 value, keep in mind that can be a very big adjustment if you're already at a high multiplier. Right. So, you know, 105 versus 45 multiplier is a pretty big jump yeah. versus just, let's say, 101.5, you know, so you, you want to be conscientious of that. So we just saw the system uh, hit that crash point, I guess. Right, I guess we'll and, call it and we can see also, right, you saw that the temperatures that were being reported were pretty close to almost 90 C. So mm -hmm. we know that the software at this point is probably getting pretty close to getting us to our maximum value because it knows we don't want to go any further than that. The, the temperature point is already pretty much at the ceiling that we would Does the software achieve. have the flexibility to maybe, uh, say if it was set at 85, could you set it at 90 and mm -hmm. then say, let's run that software again? Or is that something that is off limits? Yeah, currently that's actually not available. Um, okay. In our first generation of software, we actually did have that available. Um, but it did actually add um, a longer time frame to the process. But that's something that we'll, we'll continue to monitor on our users' feedback. Okay. So we can see here, it's gone ahead and completed the value. It went ahead and went a little bit less conservative than what the maximum value was before it completed its overclock. But we can see that we have a fairly healthy bump. Uh, 4.5. Stock value is 3.7? Yeah, th exactly, 3.7. So we've gone now to 4.5 gigahertz. Our iGPU has been significantly boofed, bumped up to, to 1250. And if we were to go ahead and let's say open up ADA, uh, we'll go ahead and open up the magnifier too so that we can sure. uh, see this a little bit more clearly. And we go to our CPU uh, ID tool. We can see here that we've also effectively overclocked the memory too. So from our baseline of 1333, uh, we're now at 1968. So we've, uh, we've effectively completed an overclock to all these values. So CPU, memory, iGPU. Now using this type of automated overclocking utility then, is, it, is there a lot of benefit to having uh, higher clocked memory or the uh, memory that has more headroom in that sure because area because we, we can do that I, I think that a lot of users sometimes don't have as much knowledge on how to overclock memory outside of just using like XMP values yeah um, so they, they kind of get a little bit more confused about relaxing timings or applying voltages to be able to scale the memory up gotcha. so um, I, I definitely don't recommend getting crazy I think that it makes sense still for this platform to focus at like 2133, maybe 2400. I think 2400 kits are still more tuned for the guys that really feel comfortable going into the UEFI and detailing everything out. Gotcha. But 2133 is a good marker to put on here and let the board work through trying to automatically scale to it. And it's gonna get either pretty close to it or right around that marker. So, and effectively while overclocking the rest of the platform. Um, and you can see here that what we're talking about in terms of the offset voltages, right? Yeah. You can see as it's idling, right, we're, we're using a much more efficient voltage mechanism. Right. And I see the GPU, uh, the CPU clock does come down to the 1.6 exactly. gigahertz or so. And, and if we were then going to go ahead and let's say like stress test the CPU, right, uh, we can go ahead and we're going to go down here, hit the stress test, and then move up. And we can see right there, see the voltage ramps up, right? But we have a much more sensible mechanism at how uh, an overclock is affected by using an offset mechanism as opposed to using a fixed voltage mechanism. Cool. Yeah.
So uh, I think that gives us a little bit of a perspective regarding uh, overclocking on Ivy Bridge and some of, the, some of the options that you have available on our platform as well as some of the considerations to keep in mind uh, for overclocking on Ivy Bridge. Cool. So after we've done, uh, we've, we've talked about the TPU switch, we've talked about the auto-tuning software, kind of the automated overclocking. Now, what if you mm -hmm. get to that setting, maybe you want to do some more of the manual tweaking, you uh, have some Windows software for that too inside AI Suite. Yeah, definitely. You have some flexibility, and the great thing is, of course, that we have the same level of controls within the operating system uh, that are being digitally controlled and hardware controlled and fed. So okay. keep in mind that it's an adjustment that you're making within the operating system, but it's still essentially the same like executing it within the UEFI. Okay. Um, so we'll just go here to our tool option, and we'll go first to the DigiPlus power control. This control set is going to be predominantly focused at modifications to the VRM. Yeah. We'll get uh, the magnifier opened up here. And uh, we've got a couple of different panels. Like here, we have one uh, that if we click into, we've got our smart DigiPlus key, which is a way, if we click this OC now, it just opens up a whole bunch of parameters, like let's say um, OCP, which is overcurrent protection mechanisms mm -hmm. or load line calibration, kind of just sets them all to very high values that are focused at enthusiast level kind of overclocking. Um, on the opposite end, actually, we have these targeted package profiles for people that aren't overclocking. But what we want to focus on here is actually going to be under the CPU power control section. So when we load this up, we've got a couple of key options that as overclockers we're always interested in. One is load line calibration. Right. The great part about it though is that being able to control it real time, what we can go ahead and do is if we, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and adjust it here in a moment uh, by taking out the magnifier, but you can actually see how this is going to affect the droop process real time. Normally you would have to go into the UEFI, make that adjustment, reboot, go into Windows Stress, and then see if there's an issue, right? But here, I can go ahead and keep a frequency where I know that I'm stable at, mm -hmm. right? But actually just make an adjustment to each stepping and see how much it's applying for me. So then I can kind of have an idea. Wow, okay, I know if I use you know, medium as opposed to ultra, right? Because does it make sense for me to jump all the way up to extreme? Maybe not. Right, because then that's going to be then actually doing an over voltage and getting too much voltage. Okay. And what we ideally want to try to keep is one to one ratios, right? Which is if I'm putting in, let's say, a value of like 1.3, I want to try to be approximate to 1.3. I don't generally want to give more than what I need, right? Okay. Um, same thing here. This overcurrent capability is important because the board, by default, we of course design it to have values of operation up to a certain level. And at some point, you're going to exceed and provide more voltage and have a higher level wattage draw than what it's targeted at, at stock level of operation. And that's actually what OCP is. It allows you to essentially extend it. So very similar to kind of like power tune controls that you have like under graphics cards now where you can open up that so you can have potentially higher clock speeds to be uh, provided. It's the same type of concept, but motherboards have had this for a long time with OCP control. But uh, you can, of course, make this adjustable within the operating system. Now, this means just because you select, let's say, this value doesn't mean automatically like the board is drawing 140% more. It's just essentially enabling that it's allowing. It's allowed for, to go over to uh, that amount. Exactly, okay. allowed okay. to go to that amount. Um, we've got the same type of control load line calibration for the iGPU. Really, only focus that if you're overclocking the iGPU. Right. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to worry about it. Um, this one is interesting, which is power phase control. Now, our Phase management is always hardware based, but we do allow you to control it in software if you want to or in the UEFI. So under this example, Extreme, Extreme for instance will actually run all phases active at all times. So under idle power, under full power, excuse me, under full load, it's always actively running. That's going to produce the most heat, but always ensure the highest level of power delivery. Uh, the other option would be something like Optimize, where we use phase switching and we use our own auto rolls. So depending on the load, we'll dynamically load the phase array. Uh, for the best kind of okay. heat to performance to power delivery. Uh, while standard follows the Intel spec rule and will only use those phases under idle. Uh, regardless under full gotcha. phase, you're always going to use all maximum phases when the board always uh, goes under full load. So what these are essentially just adjusting is how the idle or slight idle uh, phase management is okay. occurring. Okay. Um, and you can of course make other adjustments relative to this like a power thermal control which lets you adjust the uh, VRM temperature junction points. So if you don't have a lot of ambient cooling mm -hmm. for the VRM assembly, you don't want that to get too hot because that could cause a throttle to the CPU. You can make adjustments to that. And this power duty control is very similar. The power management uh, that we have for the phase array can either be done based off of current or based off of temperature. Now temperature is preferred for most users even up to let's say 4.6, 4.7, maybe even 4.8 gigahertz. The disadvantage though is we're artificially going to cap power delivery because we're, we're, we want to normalize temperature across the VRM. We're extreme, what we care about is current delivery. 
um, which is going to produce more heat, but lets us draw as much power uh, through all the, the phase array as possible. So all this can be adjusted. Now, what that means is, well, what am I doing when I actually try this, right? So if we go ahead and just uh, get out here of our magnifier for a moment, and let's say we were to go once again to, uh, let's, let's use like a benchmark just as like a reference here. So, you know, uh, you've probably uh, used Cinebench maybe, too many times. Maybe once or twice, yeah. Too many times, I think, to, to count, right? Um, so we're, we'll just do multi-core, right? And uh, we're also going to use ADA here as an option. And just to look at our frequencies and, and see how things are, even though we have this same option available in AI Suite. So we can see here, we have our frequency, we have our voltage. And if you run that, right, you're going to see now all of a sudden your frequency you're running at as well as your corresponding voltage, right? Mm -hmm. So at that point, what I could go ahead and do is I go, okay, I'm at 4.5, 1.272. So I could go ahead and cancel out of that, right? Stop that. And from here, let's say, maybe I want to add a little bit of load line calibration. So maybe I want to go to medium. And I can go ahead and apply that. And from here, I can go ahead and rerun. And now I can see, we can already see that we have now have a change. So our voltage has gone from 1.272 to 1.304. Exactly. Okay. Right. So we know that we've made that, that modification. So we know we've got maybe a little bit more wriggle room. So at that point, maybe I don't want to adjust anything else because I think that all these other options are relatively fine. So from here, I can go to like Turbo V Evo and, uh, excuse me, go to switch over here in a moment. So we've gone ahead and loaded up the Turbo V Evo and we have the ratio controls that are available to us here. Now we can go ahead and go group tuning, which means, like we've talked about in the force, all fixing all multipliers right. to all values. Um, or we can go ahead and have asynchronous control actually with Ivy Bridge, where we could make adjustments to each one and ratchet it up. Okay. Uh, but for our purposes, let's just go ahead and just go with group tuning. Okay. And uh, let's say we're going to go 4.6, but because we're of course reaching different points, let's go ahead and maybe make this a little bit more conservative, and we'll go back to like a 100 value. So then that way we're, we're effectively shooting for like a 4.6 value. Okay. Okay. But this is also showing you that you have all these adjustments available to you real time, right? So from that point, we can go ahead and, uh, excuse me, actually, we're going to be at 44. So we'll first apply that. We'll see that change go into effect. And so it actually takes a little bit longer for the software to register, but the board should actually have already received uh, the change uh, here in a moment. And so you can see right here, we're now already at 44. 44 multiplier. Ex exactly. Gotcha. And so at this point, you could go ahead and once again recheck your work lightly, right? And this is the cool part, right? You haven't had to do any type of rebooting or anything, right? You've just essentially effectively gone through. You're still checking kind of stress testing here, right? Because you're using the core, you're seeing where the voltage is at, and you go, okay. I know I'm fine here. So now I've made that adjustment. Now I want to go back here and I am going to go ahead and modify and continue my scaling process. So at this point, you could go ahead and once again continue to raise up, let's say, the multiplier, uh, maybe make an adjustment to the load line calibration process to give you a little bit more phase adjustment, whatnot. So let's go ahead and let's say 4.6. Um, we could go ahead and maybe actually give us maybe a little bit more voltage. Let's go 1.3, try to fuse 4.7. And uh, we'll hit apply to that. OK, so we're going to go ahead and run it now with the adjustments that we've made. At that 47 multiplier, the voltage has been increased accordingly. And here we can see, right, we've got 4.7 gigahertz, that modified B clock value of 100 that we made, and then the corresponding voltage table that we have. You know, And you can, of course, always you know, make an adjustment as you see sensible, right? So if you notice that you go through and run a couple of benches, everything looks okay at that voltage, then you could go ahead and continue to drop it down a little bit by little bit real time and see where you need to run it at. And sensibly, you should always use the applications or the games that you feel you're gonna run on the system as your benchmark for stability. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. worst case scenario, yeah, it might fail maybe under, let's say, Prime. Or it might even fail under Cinebench, which actually has very similar power draw levels as high stress applications. But if all I'm doing at the end of the day is running YouTube, um, you know, watching, you know, uh, you know, using Microsoft Office, watching online video, and you know, playing games, 
you know, those factors actually, you, you might be able to get away with a high level overclock that might not be as stable under that full stress test application, but if they're stable under your games, it's stable. You know, so there's, there's Fair a, enough. It's a relative degree as to what you want to quantify to stability. Um, but you know, those are all good pieces of information that also, if you use something like ADA, you can also reference uh, in terms of wattage data, uh, which not a lot of people account for, uh, but this is a good marker to also help you to understand how much is occurring when you overclock in terms of the draw, which is also relative to the heat package. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because, of course, if we were to run a game, the wattage draw is going to be significantly different than if you're quantifying it with some type of prime application, right? right. So if I'm never actually reaching the wattage draw of prime, then you know, it, it's, it's about just using the right contextual application. So that gives you a little bit of perspective behind uh, benchmarking utilizing, excuse me, uh, overclocking utilizing software. Very cool. So uh, we're, we're really interested in looking forward to spending more time with the Ivy Bridge and seeing how it really compares uh, to Sandy Bridge in terms of that overclocking thing. So we look forward to testing out these E77 motherboards. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Be sure to check out PCPer.com for more reviews and information on everything PC hardware.